No problem, man. All right, everyone, thanks again for uh, stopping by the Brownells booth. It's a pleasure to have everyone. Uh, I, my name's Ryan Rett. I'm a head of communications for Brownells. I'm joined by Paul Levy on the far end with Brownells. Uh, also, Fagan from KE Arms. And, of course, the familiar Ian and Carl from In Range TV. So we have a, some pretty cool announcements today we'll share with you. Roy Hill is in the back, and he has uh, press uh, kits with all the data and the details uh, when we finish. So before we get kicked off, we will watch a quick video that gives kind of a highlight of what's going to happen today. Effort, effort in the video. Just a minute. Thanks to uh, Carl for producing the video, and actually he uh, he didn't put in audio. Uh, the audio just didn't work, so uh, it, was, it was nice to stand in silence for a couple minutes. But we have our own audio man, Paul Levy, here, who's going to give you the, the whole rundown of what's going on, what's new, and then we'll have commentary from everybody else. Paul? Sure. So uh, starting off, we've got the BRN 180 uh, products. Uh, you're familiar with the upper receiver. New this year, we've got the lower receivers to go with it. Uh, so we've got, right here we have the BRN 180M. And that's a billet lower AR-15 styling, like modern stylings, hence the M. Uh, it's got a Picatinny rail built in, so that accommodates braces and folding socks nicely, so it can function uh, with the sock folded or, or uh, in the open position as well. And we do have another version that many of you will be excited about, right there. Thank you, Ian. So this is the BRN 180 lower. So this is stylized after the original AR 180. Uh, it's a forged receiver, but again, integrates the Picatinny rail so you can attach a folding uh, brace or stock. You may notice this stock right here, uh, thanks to B5, they developed this stylized after the original AR 180 stock. So it's super thin, uh, folds to the side nice and cleanly, and obviously uh, honors that original uh, 180 design and styling. So that's new for Brownells, the BRN 180 lowers so you can check out those today on our site and then also on our site we've got the what would stoner do 2020 gun which i'll let these fine gentlemen discuss testing all right so hi i'm carl from in range tv and if you want to see that video with audio it will be on the channel tomorrow so <laughs> you can get the full effect on that but um so we have ian here holding the prototype version of the what would stoner do 2020 the 2017 build that we came up with actually originated when I was traveling for a match and I picked up an original Colt SP-1. 
and started shooting it, and I'm like, what happened to the AR-15 that we went from something that was modern materials, lightweight, handy, and accurate, to these beasts that we now carry today? And we've seen this through a lot of military adaptation processes where something that starts off good lands up somewhere different. <laughs> and the AR, I feel, in, in, a, long, in a, lot of, a lot of ways has gotten to that point. So we started focusing on the most modern materials and the ideas that Eugene Stoner tried to epitomize when they downsized it with Jim Sullivan into the AR-15. Polymer lower, carbon fiber free float tube, pencil barrels, which are now viable again, and coming in with a gun that is completely accurate, reliable, doesn't shift zero at under six pounds with an optic. So Ian, do you want to add something to that? So there were a lot of elements in the original AR-15 that were good ideas that didn't work because the technology wasn't quite there at the time. So the pencil barrel is a perfect example. Uh, the barrels that Colt was making in the 60s didn't have the heat treating that we have today. And so when they got hot, the zero would shift in unpredictable directions. We've got a great Faxon barrel in here that doesn't do that. It gets hot, the group enlarges, as one would expect, but it stays in the same place. And that allows us to go back to a very lightweight pencil barrel instead of being forced to put in you know, something big like an M4 profile barrel just to try and keep the zero in the same place. Uh, our polymer receiver is actually designed from the ground up to be a, made of polymer. It exploits the, the material properties of polymer, in, which is in many ways superior to aluminum if you design for it. So this lower flexes. If this gets hit by something, if it gets run over by something, it will bend and it will come back, um, unlike the, the, the permanent deformation you'll get in aluminum. Um, in order to accommodate that, we redesigned the lower, well, we didn't, uh, this goes back to cab arms and then G-Wax, uh, integrated, in fact, it actually goes back to Colt, who experimented with this in the 70s, uh, integrated the pistol grip, the butt stock, the buffer tube, and the lower receiver all into one contiguous piece. So Ian touched on a couple things that are really interesting. Way back when I was using an old Mark II lower, and we had an event, actually, Fagan was using a Mark II lower, and I was using a traditional AR-15, and we were at a competition in which someone accidentally ran over our guns with a truck. And my gun was destroyed. The buffer tube mating assembly cracked. A lot of things on the traditional AR-15 aluminum lower failed. And the, the Mark II lower bent, went back into shape, and was actually functional after that tra traumatic event. And so one of the things we hear about with polymer lowers, which Ian touched upon, is that when you look at a polymer lower, that a lot of people just take an AR-15 lower and make it out of polymer. It's not the right idea. It has to be designed for the material in mind, which I think is something that you would have seen Stoner and Sullivan do. Uh, uh, there are, in addition, a whole bunch of subtle features on this that I don't know if we have time to go into all of them right here, but uh, we have a carbon fiber handguard, reduced weight, reduced heat transference. Uh, we have fully ambidextrous controls on the rifle. We have a beveled magazine well uh, for quicker reloading. We have sling, sling points back on the stock. We have an ambidextrous gas-shielded charging handle on it. Uh, we have a, 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 a unit-captured buffer assembly, so you don't need a buffer retention pin that, not often, but every once in a while, snaps off, falls into your trigger, and makes the gun stop working. We have a KE Arms SLT trigger in there, which is both a fantastic trigger pull, you guys will be welcome to try that out, and a 45 degree safety lever, and you can engage that safety whether the gun has been fired or not fired. One of the weird quirks of the AR Fire Control Group originally was, if you've dry fired the gun, you cannot engage the safety. And a lot of people will rationalize that and we can do this with it. But in reality, if you can always engage the safety, that's a superior system. So the one thing that we were never able to do with this on video is convey just how nice it is to handle a five and a half pound rifle that balances like this. You can't see that on video. And I'm really excited that now we have a model here that we can show you guys and you can get that uh, perception yourselves. So. Uh, this is, of course, a 3D printed lower um, because our mold tooling is not complete yet, uh, but it, it's built from the exact same solid model file that we use to build the mold tooling. So, uh, Just everything that's going into this is uh, making use of all the knowledge we've gained over the past almost 20 years working with polymers with the monolithic receiver design. I was at Cab Arms from 2001 to 2010. Mm -hmm. and glad to be able to bring this product back to market under KE Arms today. All right. Paul, do you want to talk about uh, availability on these, on all the products? Sure, sure. So, uh, this will be... 
So the Woolwood Cylinder New 2020 rifle is available today for pre-order on brownells.com. That's uh, going to be shipping here later this year. Uh, the BRN 180M low receiver is available right now on brownells.com. You can order that today. And the BRN 180 uh, low receiver, the forged version, stylized like the original 180, that's going to be available here later, but you can uh, pre-order it today on the website. Just to clarify, um, I may have a reputation with pre-orders. How much money do you take from someone who pre-orders? So this goes for anything from Brownells. We don't capture your money. We don't charge your card for a pre-order. So you will only be uh, you will only pay when the product actually physically ships to you. Good pointing. Woo! Any questions right now? We'll also be available here afterwards if you want to ask any questions uh, one on one uh, afterwards. All right, we have these two gentlemen. So, um, so uh, looking at the uh, lower receiver, I've noticed it's uh, made to use a carbine buffer and uh, buffer spring. I was curious why you chose to use that as opposed to a uh, A1 buffer and buffer spring. So the earliest CAV-15 Mark 1s, we didn't even call them that at the time, used a rifle buffer and spring, but they didn't have enough reinforcement ribbing behind the buffer tube assembly. So those early models would have the buffer and buffer spring beat their way out the back of the receiver. So all that reinforcement ribbing you saw in the 3D model is necessary for the durability and longevity of the receiver. The thickness of the polymer at the rear makes a big difference. When you're dealing with polymer, you have to build it. When you're dealing with a different material like polymer, you have to deal with dealing with polymer. And so having more rigidity at the rear of the stock allows for what Fagan said, to make sure that you don't have a failure point when using the buffer system. Also, uh, what kind of polymer are you guys using for that? Are you using like a nylon uh, six with glass fill and fill, or what, what kind of polymer are you actually using? What percentage of glass is it? Stuff like that. So, <clears throat> it is going to be a glass filled nylon six. Uh, the exact percentage to be determined. We're doing mold flow analysis to determine which uh, percentage will work the best and weld the best with the new mold design. Traditionally, they were 30%. We're looking at potentially higher percentages to increase durability, but that has some trade-offs. So we're doing everything we can to design this uh, the right way out of the gate and make sure that it's going to be durable and hold up for tens of thousands of rounds. The original Mark II receivers lasted for 50,000 plus rounds that I personally documented, and there's no reason they shouldn't even last longer than that. Uh, so with the Mark III, we're exploring some other options, but um, Worst case scenario, we'll go with tradition because you know 30% glass will not only work and hold up for a very long time for this application. Paul, is that going to be Q1 or Q2 production? Q1 or Q2 production? Q2. There you go. Two. Yes, we'll have black and tan. Flat darker. And flat, flat darker, I'm sorry, not tan. Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? And we'll be hanging around here for a while too. Will this be uh, utilizing captured takedown pins? So the uh, takedown pins have the springs and detents built into them. There's a couple reasons for that. Uh, the first is that drilling those small holes for the traditional springs and detents for takedown pins is a high scrap rate area in production because the drills are small and can walk out the wall of the receiver. The second is those holes formed for the traditional AR-15 takedown uh, pin spring and detents become fail points in the polymer. So um, in the oldest CAV-15s, they would crack through that rear pin hole there, right through the spring and detent hole. Um, on the front, it would just cause a cosmetic issue where it would break out on the outer wall. So uh, the reason we're going with a uh, pins with the springs and detents built in is twofold, reduce scrap rate, and secondly, to increase uh, longevity and durability of the part. On that, on that note, again, once again, we're dealing with polymer and you have to design around the material you're working with. But like when you look at the HK designs in which the pins weren't necessarily retained, you would use this the same way. Pull the pin out, take the lower off, put the pins right back in the lower, you're not going to lose them. They're not retained, but it's also not a problem as long as there's just a tiny a modicum of discipline in your maintenance of the gun. Brownells sell spare pins? Yes. Uh, and just a reminder, there are media kits available with Roy. Roy, could you raise your hand? So he has media kits right there if you want to snag a USB drive. 
you guys have any uh, plans to switch uh, different lengths of poles with the stocks in the future, or maybe different angles to accommodate those lengths of pole for the hand for the actual grip? So let me let me answer that from my perspective as a shooter, and then we'll get to Fagan about the technical elements of it. So it was funny. This came up a lot with the What Would Stone Do 2017 project, in which everyone was like, the, the non-adjustable length of pull was kind of a problem for them. And I understand that there are times and places where that is a benefit. But when we started doing real looking around and analysis, so we go to this two gun match or our brutality matches or anything else, and be like, everybody bring your ARs out with all of the whiz bang buttons and, and adjustable length of pull. And we lined up. I'm not kidding. Ten of them. And with the exception, I think, one, they were all A1 length. Like, it turns out you can adjust it all day long, but when you're done, it almost always is A1 length. So this currently is A1 length, but there's some other plans afoot. So the stock is actually set up to accept any A1 or A2 buck plate. So if you want to make it longer, there's already a number of systems on the market that make that possible. So I know there are some taller guys that they want to have closer to a 13 and a half or 14 inch length of pull for uh, comfort. Um, but for most people, like Carl said, the A1 length works well. The other thing is there are some options for aftermarket modifications, uh, potential uh, that people have done with the previous generations of receivers to reduce length. It's not necessarily something we're going to endorse, uh, but it is possible. For anyone who is um, skilled at doing grip or stippling reduction style work, uh, the receiver will lend itself to those same kind of operations. So half by 28 attachments. So, in, so this this fax on barrel is the one with the permanently attached flash hider, and that's one of the ones we showed in the video where we were demonstrating the heat stress test. But we ultimately looked at what we were doing and tested a number of different barrels. And for the reasons of modularity, as well as keeping the same weight profile, we're actually going with the 16-inch threaded fax on pencil barrel with a detachable muzzle device. So it'll be capable of handling suppressors or whatever muzzle device you want. And we're currently looking at and probably are going to go with an alternative modern material for the flash hider. Titanium is the one we're looking at currently, and we're working with KE Arms on that. Do you have anything you want to add to that? No. So it will be a half by 28? Correct. Uh, yes, it will be. That's it. Yes, sir. On that note, are you looking at uh, different barrel profiles for suppressors in mind, or are you going to stick with a pencil? For nope. <laughs> Just pencil. Are you guys passing that rifle around? We are now. <laughs> Any other questions? We'll be circulating around, so... All right, here you go. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if you have questions, snag one of us here afterwards. We'll be happy to answer and take care of you. Thanks again for stopping by. Thank you. Thank you.